Well, thanks for coming out on a rainy day here. Um, I always say when people come in the dental office uh, that when it's raining out, you're not missing a thing out there, so you might as well come in and be in, in the dental office. So it'd be the same with this. But um, we're going to talk a little bit about what happens uh, as we age and how it correlates with oral health and that. First off, um, I am the one on the right, the old guy. Uh, but I have a partner, Jessica Carrillo, and we have two associates that work with us. Uh, this is Tim Jernberg here, and that's my son, Garrett Klaus. Um, and uh, we, we are over in North Mankato there. Um, oral health. Uh, it changes, you know, your needs change with every decade, you know, but the good news is that it's not too late to take care of your teeth, okay? Losing your teeth and getting dentures is no longer the inevitable, you know? It, you were going to basically, today people are more informed, um, get out there and see your dentist and find out what you can do to keep your teeth. You don't have to have them taken out, but as uh, you know, in the past, you know, like when you're younger, you still have to take care of your teeth almost the same way. You got to brush and floss regularly, avoid your sweets and sodas, and visit your dentist, okay? That's probably one of the most important things right there is we can check for cavities, gum disease, check to see if your dentures or partials are fitting fine, and also check for oral cancer too. Um, there's a direct where we're finding out more and more correlations with, between oral health and overall health. When, it was kind of interesting way back when, years and years and decades ago, they always talked about teeth being a problem or diseases throughout the body. And when I went to dental school, which was about 35 years ago, they kind of poo-pooed that idea, thinking, okay, well, the diseases in your mouth at that time really are separate from the things that are going on in your body. But that tide is changing. We're finding that there's more and more correlation between diseases in the mouth and diseases over in the body. You can't be healthy without good oral health. All right, so today, excuse me, we're going to talk about all these different correlations. First, we're gonna talk about periodontal or gum disease and cardiovascular disease and periodontal disease and diabetes, periodontal disease and Alzheimer's. We're also going to talk a little about xerostomia, which is dry mouth, osteoporosis, sleep apnea, and then there's a few other things we'll talk about after that too. So what is periodontal disease? You know, you hear about this all the time. It's basically inflammation. You know, it starts out as gingivitis, which is typically not painful at all or anything, but you know, when you brush your teeth and you get a little bit of bleeding there, and you know, and it's not too bad, but it can progress into periodontitis. Gingivitis can be reversible. Periodontitis is difficult to reverse, but it's basically all about bacteria, okay? Here is your healthy tooth, okay? And there's your tooth there with what we call calculus around it. Now, the way I always kind of explain it to patients is, imagine your tooth is this island, okay? And the coral reef that's around the island, that's what that calculus, or commonly known as tartar, is around your tooth. And like the coral reef, which is porous, hard, full of all kinds of organisms, that calculus is the same way. It's hard and porous and full of bacteria and all kinds of different biofilms, things like that that produce toxins that irritate the gum tissue, that inflammation, and also the bone underneath. Here is a kind of an overview of what happens. You get this buildup. Here's your coral reef, and you see the gum tissue gets irritated, and then it all start, starts to progress along the root surface, and you get these pockets, and you go to the dental office, they're always, you know, we're always probing around, we're checking for pockets. That's what we're looking for, and we're also feeling for this buildup, this coral reef around the tooth. And it can start off, okay, you got your healthy gums, is there a probe? And you can get a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper, and also very deep, when we start losing over 50% of the bone there, that's when your teeth start getting loose, okay? And then that's when they start moving on you and falling out. It's just basically with this slide here, I just wanted to say here that this is the most important thing here. 90% of the people out there have 
some type of gum disease or you know or gingivitis or periodontitis okay and like here that's where we lose our bone we lose or the gum tissue the bone and then the teeth start getting loose in there okay now periodontal disease basically is interrelated with a lot of different things it can give you bad breath because in the periodontal disease which is bacteria it's the type of bacteria that are anaerobic which are deep down in the pockets and those are the ones that cause the bad odors okay so you get bad breath get your gums to recede because they're inflamed and that doesn't look so nice plus when they recede sometimes you can get some hypersensitive teeth because the roots are exposed, the roots aren't protected as much. Then you get your mobility, okay? And then if you get the recession, you can get cavities easier on your roots than you can on the hard enamel protected part, top part of the tooth, the crown portion. And of course, all these things can cause pain. And then we get mobile mobility, you can get tooth loss, and of course, then you get your chewing difficulty, and that throws off your diet. But this is what we're going to talk about right now. Your systemic inflammation mean your overall body inflammation, okay? And diseases can arise from that. First, we'll talk about gum disease and cardiovascular disease. Individuals with gum disease are 25% more likely to develop coronary heart disease. And as the severity of gum disease goes up, so does the severity or chances of cardiovascular disease. Now, I should say that they're finding, doing a lot of studies on this, and they can't really say that there's a direct correlation yet at this point, but everything is kind of pointing that direction. And if, if we can take care of gum disease, maybe we can help out with the heart too, okay? So, like I said before, inflammation, that's the big thing. Um, and inflammation is from due to bacteria and the toxins produce it, produced from there. Now, we know that... Um, uh, this inflammation it affects the arteries and the arteries then get thickened and you get atherosclerosis and then that makes it tough for the blood to get to the heart and also to the brain and that gives you a chance to exit strokes and then the bacteria found in gum, in gum disease it is found in the heart too at times too so these appear to go hand in hand and like I said they're coming up with more and more studies showing this. Now we'll go to the next one, gum disease and diabetes. Um, they're kind of, they're very, very interrelated. And um, you can, in fact, gum disease is now considered the sixth complication of diabetes, along with, you know, other complications there, eyesight, kidneys, all kinds of different things like that. But poorly controlled diabetics are more than likely develop periodontal disease than well-controlled diabetics. And poorly controlled diabetics have a threefold increase in having gum disease compared to non-diabetics. So we know there's definite correlation between the two. Now this is something that's just really come out pretty recently. This was from a conference in, uh, uh, in 2011 and they're having a little bit more research on this now too. But they came up with the, the thing that exposure to inflammation early in life from such like periodontal disease quadruples your chance for developing Alzheimer's disease. So even if there's a slight chance, I think you'd want to try to to keep that chance down. And also they're finding correlations and this may not what's the first the the, the chicken or the egg. This is a type of thing where People with Alzheimer's disease, you know, they're more likely not to have the great daily personal oral hygiene. And you know, they may have a decreased ability to report pain or discomfort and thus go see a dentist or whoever. And they may resist uh, assistance from caregivers. So there's definite correlation between um, gum disease and Alzheimer's. Now we'll talk a little bit about dry mouth. Xerostomia. It's estimated that 25% of seniors have dry mouth. Now, saliva is very important. It protects the mouth. It neutralizes acid. It kills the bacteria and, the germ and germs and remineralizes teeth. They have fluoride and calcium that gets in the, floor, in the saliva. You know, I, I see it a lot where people, you know, they get older and they get dry mouth. 
Well, what causes that? Well, diabetes sometimes can be interrelated with that. There's some other autoimmune type of diseases. Um, cancer treatments can do that too. A lot of times if people get like cancer in the head or neck, and now they're really careful about this, but a lot of times what they'll do is, is they'll get radiation exposure to the, the saliva glands. You've got three main ones. You've got two back in here. There's a couple down in this area here too, underneath. If they aren't protected when you have the radiation, then your saliva flow decreases, and then that you know gives you problems. But probably the most common is the type of medications that we take as we get older. You know, you got your antidepressants, antipsychotics, antihistamines, decongestants, antihypertensives, which, you know, your blood pressure medication, your di um, diuretics, and your Parkinson's type of drugs. All these drugs, this is a minor list of type of um, drugs that can give you um, dry mouth. Now, common, and this just means here, with this slide here, we're just talking about, you know, dry mouth is not a normal consequence of aging, okay? The major cause is the medication that we're taking, okay? Now, also what's very you know, common, and I see this all the time, too, with um, older people, is that they'll have several different medications that, um, given to them to combat disease, and that's what they call polypharmacy. And it's the inner action of those drugs that can cause dry mouth, okay? Um, and then also the correlations between diabetes and Alzheimer's with dry mouth also. Okay. Other ways that you can get dry mouth, sometimes people just don't drink enough water, and we need to get that in there. And then things that come from dry mouth besides, you know, just discomfort, you can get cavities from it. You get your cracked lips, fish your tongue, oral mucositis, and it affects your taste. I don't know if anybody's have gone, had that before, but it affects your taste, speaking, just enjoyment and ingestion of food, and also it affects how your dentures fit too. These are some of the things that I just saw actually this morning with an older gentleman. His mouth is so dry. He had the fish your tongue here. He had cavities on every single tooth, and his tongue was, well, his look more like this than that, but you can, this is a condition here of candidiasis, which is uh, like a fungal infection, okay? The saliva isn't there to buffer it. And then of course, a lot of um, uh, gum, gum problems there too, because we don't have any buffering saliva. Um, so what do we do? Uh, a lot of times we use these saliva substitutes. Um, it's basically rinses sprays like that. I got some pictures of some of the products. Um, and then you, you know, you, you drink a lot more water, you're going to have more water to be able to, you know, get through the saliva system and everything like that. But one of the most important things to, it, to do is to increase your fluoride intake, um, either be in drinking fluoridated water, doing brushing teeth with maybe not just a tooth, regular toothpaste, but a prescription this is extremely popular. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. I've got um, a product here that I really like. Um, and then alcohol dries you out, okay? So we'll try to stay away from that. Your tobacco, sugary drinks. This is a big thing here is xylitol. Xylitol is a sugar that bacteria love, but they can't utilize. And so when they get exposed to it, they actually ingest it or they bring it in and they can't use it, so then they die. So xylitol has been proven and shown over and over and over to help with cavities, okay? Um, the problem with xylitol, there's a couple. You have to have a lot of it. You have to have be exposed to at least four times a day to it. So you see some of these products um, like xylitol, but that's not one. But there's um, some gums out there that uh, just can't ice. Ice cubes or ice chips, things like that. They have xylitol in them, but you just have to constantly make sure you're chewing it, okay? And you got to be careful if you have pets, you have dogs, because xylitol and dogs don't go well together. So you make sure that your dogs don't get into that stuff. But it is, it, it's a very um, um, proven um, uh, way to prevent cavities. 
these are some of the rinses here. Some of the uh, more popular ones, probably biotin. You may have heard of that one the most there. I mean, we, we give out samples like with this stuff all the time. But Oasis is another one that's, that seems to be popular. And this is a fairly uh, newer one that I've been um, uh, using with patients too. It's called All Day, and some of them really like it. The nice thing about this one is it's got all in it, okay? Um, then you get some toothpaste, the biotin toothpastes, and then your, here's your spray too that you can just, you know, spray in there to get some relief right away. Um, oh, I guess I don't have the picture, but the toothpaste that I was going to talk about is, um, yeah, we'll get to the next one. Uh, toothpaste that has five times the amount of fluoride in it. Um, one that I really like is called Prevident. It's made by Colgate. They got a really lot of good flavors. We sell it like most of our dental offices, at cost. We just keep it as a um, service to patients. But the neat thing about it is you don't have to do another extra step, okay? You got your toothpaste. Everybody pretty much is they're going to brush their teeth with a toothpaste. You don't have to do another rinse or anything like that. So use that toothpaste, and you'll get the exposed to that, that uh, extra fluoride on there. Not over the counter. It's prescription only. Yep. Yep. So your dentist can give you a prescription or you can um, just buy it. Most dental offices carry. There's other types out there too. There's some generic forms too. It's called Prevident. Prevident 5000. Flavors actually are not too bad. <clears throat> okay, we'll talk a little bit about osteoporosis and oral health. Now, there's really no direct correlation between osteoporosis and oral health, but there are some ramifications of osteoporosis that affect mouth, okay? As you know, I mean, everybody probably knows what osteoporosis is, you know, it's your bone loses density. Osteoporosis means porous bone, okay? Uh, a lot of different factors to that, including your diet, sometimes physical activity, family history, hormones, lifestyle, and medications. A lot of times medications um, can affect that too. All right. So, yeah, osteoporosis or porous bone weakens everything. So you fall, it breaks a lot easier. Okay. It affects 10 million Americans. And there may be probably, that's a low number. But you can see that 80% of those are women. Um, and it affects more women than cancer, heart disease, and stroke combined. So it's very, very common. And then another 34 million have osteopenia, which is, you know, precursor to that, okay? Uh, so what's the correlation with oral health? When you're taking these um, medications to combat um, osteoporosis, it can, what it does basically, and they're called bisphosphonates, we'll talk about that a little bit more too, but bisphosphonates, what they do is they, um, try to increase your the uh, density of your uh, bone and in doing so you sacrifice some of the blood vessels that are going into the bone and that way then if you get infection in the bone then you don't have the way to get your immune system in there to fight the infection so if you get an infection in your jaw then your body can't fight it off and so it just sits there and festers okay and it's called osteoporosis of the jaw it's rare, but it is serious when you do get it. Um, I personally have only seen one patient with it. It was a 90-year-old man, and he, it was underneath his denture. And with time, in a couple months, it did clear up. But I've heard of cases where it never clears up. So it is something that you need to be aware of. Um, most of them are people on medications for, you know, they have cancer you know, take this medication to keep their bones strong and that. Or, you know, if you also is um, osteoporosis, but this develops a fewer, lower chance of getting osteonecrosis. Because usually these people are getting IVs of it, and theirs, this is oral, okay? This stuff stays in the body for a long time. IVs, it could stay in your body for like seven years. So it is something that if you are taking this, you need to tell your dentist, especially if you're going to have any surgery done, extractions, gum surgery, anything like that. Um, so this is the bisphosphonate. 
medication that um, that is associated with that. Um, but like I said before, the chances of developing it is very small, but you need to tell your dentist if you if you do are taking it. And the best thing you can do is just take really good care of your mouth, um, if, especially if you are taking this medication. And also, always talk to your physician about it, okay? They're going to have the most information for osteoporosis and bisphosphonate use, and you should never stop taking it without talking to your physician, okay? Because the chances of having a bone break are probably much higher if you decrease or if you stop taking that, then getting the risk of this osteoporosis of the jaw. So you'd be aware of it, but know that, that you're, you're, get, you're getting that medication for a reason, okay? But again, excellent oral hygiene is probably the best way to combat it. Um, sometimes when we get people that are on these medications and that, we'll send a patient maybe to oral surgeon or surgery for an extraction or something like that. And sometimes we do everything we can to avoid that because we don't want that surgery at that point. Um, so we just got to, you guys got to make sure you know, you let your, your dental team know what's going on. Now, snoring and sleep apnea, um, that's, that's a big thing. Um, it's becoming very, very popular for um, people in the oral health care field, dentists in particular, get extra training in this to help protect against um, sleep apnea and, and snoring. Uh, this is a very bad slide. I apologize. And I got a better one here first, but I want to talk about just what that is. When you get older, your muscles get, everything gets a little bit more elastic and loose, and that kind of can include the airway, all right? So when we get older, unfortunately, sometimes we get a little heavier too, and not all cases, but sometimes now that affects the neck too, and it closes off the airway. And I got a couple of really good diagrams here. Here is cross section here, okay? You're breathing, you're sleeping here, you're breathing in through your nose, it's got a nice little airway through here. Or if you had your mouth open, it'd be going through right down here too, okay? What happens with snoring is this jaw falls back, or if this passage become, is um, uh, less firm, it easily closes down. And that's what your snoring uh, noise is, is, the air passing this obstruction right through here. Now, sleep apnea is when you actually stop breathing or when you're doing the snoring and that. And that's when it gets a lot more serious. You know, sleep apnea can cause all kinds of different health problems there too. Um, so what do they do? The first thing you do is you do a sleep study. You go and they put you to sleep, and, or you not put you to sleep, but they have you sleep and monitor you and everything. It's determine if you have sleep apnea. And if you are having that problem, you, know, you probably hear about all these. Maybe some of you have this. The CPAP machine is just forced air that's going down past that point there. Works great. Some people can't tolerate them as well, though. Um, so in the dental field, we have a lot of different options to help um, with this problem, okay? One is called the snore guard, okay? This is, happens to be a silent night. I got a diagram that kind of shows you how this works here fits on your upper teeth and lower teeth. And what it does, it has this strap right here that pulls your lower jaw forward and opens up the airway. It's very simple. And sometimes, I mean, usually when we make these, we get a standard length here, but sometimes we um, have to make it shorter. But if we make that strap shorter, then it brings that jaw forward more, okay? And it works really well. Uh, just some other examples of this. This is one that has elastic straps. And this works great. People really like this. It's comfortable, but the problem is, is that these straps start stretching out over time so it doesn't hold your jaw forward. So you have to continually keep buying these straps as they stretch out. Um, but in some pe situations, people find this much more comfortable. And then there's some, some people where neither one of those work, and then we got to go to another level. And this is one that's got um, a metal hook to this, and you actually adjust this. It can bring your, kind of titrate it and bring your 
you can bring your job forward even more and it locks you in there's no way that you can bring it back so uh, let's talk about some other changes in the, in the mouth here as we age um, you know the the mucous membrane which is the lining in the mouth and that it kind of gets a little thinned out a little bit in that and so when it gets a little thin it little gets a little more suspect for you know trauma and things like that and it has a decreased immunity against pathogens getting in there okay I talked a little bit about candidiasis which is a, a fungal infection that can become uh, quite common especially with denture wares if you don't get your denture out at night and it just sits in there all night that is a very common thing that we see in the mouth and I'll talk a little bit more about that later too and then we talked a little bit about already too with oral cancers we, this, we see a lot of oral cancers with older people but now I mean this doesn't pertain to you but it made to maybe your grandchildren or children we're seeing it more more common with younger people now too because of this virus called human papilloma virus and that cause um, cancers out there so something that uh, we all have to be very very diligent about what looking at that's another reason to go see your dentist, dentist or dental team okay what are what else happens to our mouth as we age the teeth basically just kind of start wearing down a little bit you know I mean we use them for a long period of time they start the, the enamel starts wearing down sometimes we see erosion along the gum line too from really aggressive brushing or sometimes it can be due to your bite too some people have a bite that puts a lot of teeth flex on the teeth okay like a real deep bite teeth are not like steel rods they do bend a little bit and as they bend right there right at the I would say the neck of the tooth where it comes out of the, the gum line and you get these little micro fractures right there and as the micro fractures develop as you're brushing your teeth or eating or it flexes more then they start wearing away and then we get these little erosion areas right along the gum line there and that can lead to you know um, cavities sensitivity things like that now the enamel once it's worn away it's gone it, it, it can't come back the dentin on the inside of the tooth the soft part can actually get thicker but at the expense of the nerve of the tooth um, and then basically you know as that happens the teeth become more opaque so they get a little more yellow or darker looking that's why a lot of times you look at your pictures from way back when and you had nice bright white teeth now they don't look so white bright because well a couple different factors that nerve is receded more extra tooth structures in there so they're more opaque but also you pick up stain over time they're not teeth are not they're porous they'll pick up stain over time that's why you see bleaching is so popular nowadays too uh, bleaching does work because it gets into those porosities and bubbles out all the any of the organic materials that get in the dark teeth so even in older people bleaching is very popular you know it you can get a nice a lot of nice results the thing about bleaching though too is that it won't bleach the crowns that you have in there or the fillings and things like that so they might jump out at you a little bit more if the teeth around light so that's something that you got to talk to your dentist again a little about okay very safe it's we've been bleaching teeth for uh, 25 years in fact how we've discovered that bleaching works is that years ago um, uh, they would use this something called glyoxide and it was it's kind of a hydrogen peroxide in a gel it's carbamide peroxide and they would do surgeries and they would put this on these gum surgeries to kind of kill the bacteria and they found out when patients came back they had white teeth go, okay this is kind of cool you know and so then from that then they started to develop some of these products so yeah it, it works really well as long as you follow directions yeah they're basically all the same sugar soda is going to be worse okay but diet is sort of bad too because it's an acid and, and, and it's especially I tell patients the worst thing you can do is sit there and sip on pop all day okay and I see it all the time it's very common but every time you take a drink of that pop it start it you it puts your mouth in an acidic state that it takes 15 to 30 minutes to get back into a neutral state 
So if you're sipping on your pop, it's just bathing your teeth in acid all the time. So pop is tough on the teeth. It is. But if you're going to drink it, which, you know, it's kind of it's good to have every once in a while, drink it all once and be done with it. Drink some water afterwards or chew a piece of gum. You know, get that saliva flow going. Okay? Gum, and that, we could talk a little bit about that too. Gum is a really good thing because it produce, produces or, you know, gets the saliva flowing and that bathes, protects the teeth, neutralizes it. So a lot of your sugarless gums are excellent. They have been proven to protect your teeth against cavity. If you can't get, you know, you eat something, you can't brush your teeth, chew a piece of gum. That will at least get some of that flow going in there and protect the teeth. So there's nothing wrong with that. And actually, you know, you can actually chew a regular piece of gum too, as long as you chew it long enough. And that's the problem with a lot of people is you don't chew it long enough. So you chew it till that flavor is gone, but that's when the sugar is in there. And then sugar is gone, you know, and you take it out, that sugar is still sitting in your mouth. But if you continue to chew, that saliva will get in there and it'll, it'll flush away that or neutralize that sugar. So if you're going to chew a regular piece of gum, just chew it long enough. And that's at least 15 minutes, which is kind of a long time for a lot of people, including my wife. <laughs> All right, so what else happens? Well, we talked about the, the pulp receding and it makes the tooth more opaque. Um, and basically, oh, yes, as it recedes too, it calcifies in. It's kind of like if you imagine like a pipe, you know, an old uh, pipe, water pipe. That calcification that builds up on the inside, that's kind of what happens with the, the pulp or the nerve of the tooth in there. Uh, and, and, and if that happens, if you did happen to get infection into the nerve and we have to do like a root canal, which everybody's heard of, it's really a lot harder at that point because it's so calcified in, but it still can be done. But also when it recedes, it can give you decreased sensitivity to cold or sweet foods and things like that, or cavities. You know, a lot of people say, you know, wow, my teeth feel great like that, and you got cavities all over the place. It's because that nerve is receded. And, and also another fact is some people just don't react to pain, you know, from one person to the next. We're all different, you know. Teeny little cavity on one person can be terrible. Next person could have this huge cavity and never feel it. I, I never understood that and never will, I guess. But that's just the way our human bodies are. Um, cavities, we'll talk a little bit about that. Of course, we talked about sugars pop, things like that, not cleaning your teeth every day. You get your exposed root surface, there's more susceptible to that. And I hear this all the time. Why am I getting cavities? Because all my teeth have got fillings or they got crowns. The problem is, thing is, is you can get cavities around those fillings and around those crowns. The margins of those teeth, of, of those restorations are susceptible. We we can fill them, but there's always going to be a discrepancy there. It's always going to be a weak spot. So you got to clean around those areas. And if we don't, that bacteria can just, I mean, if, even if I could fill with my Explorer, it's a highway for bacteria. They're getting in there. And they're, I mean, see all the time, and get up underneath like a crown or a cap. There's huge, huge cavity up under, in, underneath of there. So. Yes, you can get cavities even when you, everything's filled or have crowns in there. Um, the cavities, I mean, is pretty straightforward. Basically, you know, you have your, your, your bacteria, you get your carbohydrates, and that produces your acid. Your acid eats your tooth, and you get your, your cavity there. I would say a, <clears throat> probably the biggest cha challenge to maintaining oral health with aging is, is cost, okay? Um, Unfortunately, you know, Medicare doesn't cover dental procedures typically, and most of the retirees don't have any dental benefits, so it's all the more reason to take good care of our teeth, and it starts way back when, or it can start today, it can start tomorrow. Um, prevention, okay? Let's talk a little bit about how do we do this, okay? Brush your teeth twice a day. That, that's it's so important. Use your fluoride toothpaste. Flossing. Everybody just loves that flossing, but it it works so well. And I'll show you some slides here on that. And of course, seeing your your dentist regularly. So once you get that hard buildup on your teeth, 
the only person get it off is either a dentist or a hygienist. You can't get it off. You just can't. That coral reef is stuck on there. All right. Oh, here's my picture of the Prevident right here. I knew I had it in here somewhere. But that Prevident, um, there's, we have Prevident 500 or 5,000 for um, dry mouths too, for sensitive teeth. I mean, it's, it's a really good product out there. Um, but get, get that fluoride in there. You know, even any, any toothpaste that has the ADA seal of approval, you know you got enough fluoride in there. There's some of these um, generic ones that don't. I, I'll never forget, I, well, I see it all the time, but I just got, had a gentleman recently that he decided that he was going to listen to some of these testimonials you hear on TV or read and journals or whatever, magazines, that this fluoride is bad for you. And so he decided that he wasn't going to use it anymore. And he came in, he had 13 cavities, which he had had no problem before. And it was all on the gum line, right where that plaque likes to sit there. And there wasn't any fluoride to protect him in there. So he's a definite believer of fluoride now. OK, brushing. A lot of people have trouble hanging on to that toothbrush. This is a simple little thing. You know, stick it in a tennis ball. You can actually, there's companies that make these handles for toothbrushes. I even had seen people where they take bike handles and use it, you know, stick your toothbrush in that. But probably some of the most popular are some of these electric toothbrushes. Okay? You got your rotary ones and you got your sonic ones here. There's two different camps on this here. Oral B Braun has more of a rotary type of thing. It's a great product. Great product. Sonicare, Philips Sonicare, it's more of that sonic wave in there. Um, in our office, we typically like this one right here, the Sonicare. The neat thing about it is, is that you don't actually have to touch the teeth with the brush. You just have to get it in the vicinity. Sonic waves will take care of the, the rest. It just blasts that off the teeth. And it makes those teeth feel nice and smooth. Now, some people don't like that feel. It tickles, you know, especially you hear it on the top teeth. It just tickles. They don't like that. But you can, there's usually settings on these toothbrushes where you can turn it down and get used to that, build it up. Um, the ni nice, really thing I like about it, too, is it's got timers on there. So it's usually typically two minutes. So that tells you, yeah, 30 seconds in each quadrant of the mouth there, okay? And you want, you can't use it like a regular toothbrush. You can't get in there and just scrub. You got to hold it there and let it do its thing there and just slowly move it around, kind of angle it, you know, right along the gum line there. Um, but it is a game changer for a lot of our patients. Our hygienists love these things. A lot of offices, and even this, these two, they're really good too. And some of these actually rotate and vibrate too, which is awesome too. Either one of these are really good products. The ones I really get nervous about, the ones that you buy over the counter, you know, go to Walgreens and they're you know, 12 bucks, 15 bucks. They usually just spin there. There's a couple of different problems with that. Usually it's a real small little circle that spins, and you have to hit every surface of that tooth with that spinning toothbrush. You just can't put it in that general area. And you can damage the gum tissue with those. You actually push too hard and you can wear away the gum tissue. These toothbrushes here have sensors on there. If you're pushing too hard, they back off. So you cannot damage tooth structure or gum tissues. Okay, what if we don't have teeth? They have these little tooth hats and washcloths and things like that, and that works well too. But the probably the most important thing I want to say, if you don't have teeth, you know, you probably have some type of either dentures and that. Some people just don't. Some people just don't have teeth and they get along great. I mean, um, I've heard people chewing nuts and things like that just on their ridges. I, yeah, it's amazing. But the main thing is, is that you still got to go in and see your dental team because of things you can get, cancers and things like that. That's probably the biggest thing right there. Um, because we see them all the well, I don't say we see them all the time. They're pretty rare, but when you do get them, like I old pathology teacher would say, yeah, to get this, the chances of getting this are extremely low, but for that person, it's 100%. So, you know, it's very true. Okay, 
flossing, how do you floss? You know, curve it around that. I got a good slide here. Um, right here, you see this? Teeth around, okay? If you just go and you pop in, you pop out, it's not gonna do what it needs to do. You gotta wrap it around that tooth there to get that plaque off of there, okay? Um, we have all kinds of different floss aids too, okay? Flossing is really difficult for a lot of people. They have arthritis or just really big fingers or maybe they're missing fingers or they have um, other issues, you know. Um, uh, so there's a lot of different things out there to help us. These are really popular. These are really popular. Um, but again, you still, when you pop that through there, you gotta pull it backwards and pull it forward to kind of move it around to get that plaque off of there. It's not as good as regular floss, but it's a great alternative. We have these things, they're called these proxy brushes. They're like little pipe cleaners. And they, and I got a good slide that shows how they are effective too in there. This is a, a nice one. The hygienists really like this one because here you can move the floss on the, the holder. Um, so you get a pre new, uh, fresh piece of floss every time you floss that. Um, um, okay, and then there's a lot more out there. These more proxy brushes. This is, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this one here too, the super floss. This one up here is a power flosser. Um, yeah, that was pretty popular for a while, but everybody found out that, yeah, it doesn't really do what you need. I don't know. If you have it and it works, great, but most people don't like it. There's your little, your um, little flosser that, you know, like I said, you gotta pop it through there, but you gotta wrap it around that tooth, so you gotta pull it forward backwards, okay? Here's your little proxy brush. See how your floss kind of can't get in the nooks and crannies? And there's a lot of teeth, especially as we get older. These areas become more prevalent in that because the gum tissue recedes a little bit. And along the root surface, we have a lot more concavities. So this brush gets in there and helps those out. Now, you have to be kind of careful with this, too. I mean, you can't get in there and just gouge away. You do have to have a little, um, you know, you have to be protective of the gum tissues a little bit there, too. Then you, some people have bridges in there, and, um, and probably everybody knows what those are, but I'll show a picture of one. But we have these bridge threaders. They're kind of like a big soft needle, you know. It's not going to hurt you at all, but you put the floss through there, pull it through, and then you can floss, okay? This is really good stuff here. This is something that we uh, really push for kids with braces, but it works with older people, works with anybody, really. It's, it's a floss that's real fuzzy and thick, okay? And it really gets the plaque out of there. Gets in those nooks and crannies like that little proxy brush. It's got these soft, or these, well, I should say not soft, but little firm leaders that you can thread it through some of these places. This person here has teeth that are splinted together and it's could be due to braces. And sometimes we splint them together for gum disease when the teeth are really mobile in there. But it makes for a harder area to clean, but that super floss helps out with that. It's been around for years. Um, now these are pictures here are showing two different water flossers and they're really, really cool too. This is called an air flosser. It's made by the same company that makes those Sonic Airs. Um, and what it is has just a little teeny reservoir in there and you push on it and it just gives a little puff. Goes and pushes the plaque right through the, between the teeth there. Um, that's really slick. A lot of people really like these. This is a one that really was popular a long time ago and then kind of, for some reason, fell out of favor, but now it's really been making a resurgence. And I've seen some really nice results with some patients. I have one lady that we tried everything. She had so much problem. Finally, we got her going on this water pick, and it's amazing the results that we got from her. Um, the thing about the water pick is, is that it's kind of a neat picture here, but a lot of water. <laughs> it gets everywhere. You have to lean over your sink, and it's going to go everywhere. But when people get used to doing that, it can work really, really well. Um, you know, they always kind of say the, the prevention, let's see, the solution to pollution is dilution, and that's what this is here, is a lot of water. It is diluting it all. Okay. Partials, dentures, um, if you get anything out of today and if you have a partial denture, 
remember this, always take it out at night or when you're sleeping. It's, there's so many things that can be, cause problems if you don't. Um, it's like wearing your shoes all night, okay? Your feet would start to get sore. Your, your gum tissues start to get sore, your, your, the ridges and everything. So take it out, clean it, soak it in a denture cleaner, um, kill the bacteria that are growing on there, your, your fungal infections and things like that. It's so much better. People that typically, I can tell when somebody comes in and I can tell when they keep it in it. I, it's always just red line, especially on the roof of the mouth. And, uh, and then we have to, it's usually uh, some kind of fungal infection. Then we got to battle against that, get on different types of lozenges. It's, it's not a lot of fun. So take it out. At night. What other things can be problems? You know, your chipped or broken teeth. We'll talk a little bit about, in a second, about that. You get a lot of mouth sores. I see it a lot. Um, TMJ, your joints up in here, probably one of the most complicated joints in your body. Um, I could talk a whole day on that. There's a lot of different things going on with that. I don't see it a lot in older people, but uh, it can happen. Um, but most most of the problems with TMJ are muscle related, which is good. Um, if you had a derangement in the joint itself, then it becomes much more of an issue, and more of a problem to manage. But usually it's just a muscle thing, and we can get that. We have ways of, of helping with that either just palliative care or splints, things like that. Um, of course, your gum disease and your improper fitting dentures. A lot of people say, oh, yeah, my dentures feel great. They fit great. And they get in there, and they're moving all over in there. We don't realize this, and if they're moving, they're causing damage to the bone beneath, and the bone sloughs away, and then it moves more. It's just a great big snowball. So you got to make sure you keep your dentures uh, fitting properly. Um, daily care. I think we've talked about this a lot, but I keep hammering it home. Brush your teeth twice a day. Use your fluoride toothpaste. You can use your toothbrush. You know, you get your electric one if you need. Do your flossing. Somehow get in between the teeth. That toothbrush just can't get in between the teeth there. Dentures, take them out. I'm going to hammer on that. Take them out at night. And drink water with fluoride. A lot of these bottled waters nowadays don't have fluoride in them. I mean, we're seeing a lot of this, or reverse osmosis systems. They take that fluoride out. So we're not getting as much fluoride as we used to when we just drank water out of the tap. Um, so tap water's good, you know. It's nothing wrong with it. It's a lot cheaper, too. Mouthwashes are good. Oh, there are parts of the country have a lot of fluoride in their water. And we get fluorosis staining, like down in Texas, we see it a lot where people would have the fluorosis staining where the teeth are yellowed. There's nothing wrong with the teeth. They're hard, but they are stained. You know, there's things that we can do with that. I would like with fluoride too. I mean, it's very important for little kids to have fluoride when their teeth are developing in that. And so a lot of times we'll supplement, um, you know, fluoride tablets for people like our well water that don't have a lot of fluoride around. But it, it's just a really good thing to have. All right. How do we fix your smile? Okay. First, you got to see your dental team. Okay. Um, you got to treat your gum disease. We're always going to check that. That's where all those probing is and everything. We're going to fix cavities. And then we got to replace lost teeth. We'll talk a little bit about that. First is your dental team. This is our tooth out back of our office, and we have a lot of fun with that. Um, but that includes your dentist, your hygienist, your assistant, business staff, and then your specialist too, your gum specialist, your oral surgeons, your root canal specialist, you know, there's orthodontists. There's just so many of them too that we utilize all the time. But your general, your quarterback of the whole situation is going to be your general dentist, okay? Got to start there. Okay. How do you clean your teeth? You know, if they get in there, those scalers, those picks and everything, what they're doing is they're knocking off those coral reefs around the the tooth, okay? They have to go below the gum line, and you heard a root plane and scaling, you know, it kind of sounds scary and everything, but what we're doing is we're just knocking off the root surface. A regular cleaning usually knocks it off the top part, but when you do your root plane and scaling, you're getting down below and you're taking more time. That's why a lot of times those off, you know, you're not getting as many teeth done. Maybe you're doing a quadrant or something like that, because it takes time to get down there for that hygienist or dentist and get that off of there. And then they smooth it. You want to smooth it up as much as you can. And in doing this whole process, you're getting all that bacteria out of there. Because just remember, those coral reefs have 
billions of bacteria in there. Okay, cavities. And everybody, and we, I don't talked about that a lot. You know, you can put white fillings in. You can put silver fillings. Um, typically, you're going to see more and more just the white fillings now. It's a resin material, and it's not just because they look nicer. They're they're very strong. They're very durable now. Um, when I started 30 years ago, these were just coming out, and uh, they they were they stained and they wore and they they definitely you know silver fillings were a much better option than even back then, but now this is getting more and more um, uh, a lot better type. You're getting better results, but they are technique sensitive. You got to find a dentist that takes the time to keep. You have to keep these areas dry, and I still I do mostly white fillings, but I still use white silver fillings if if I can't keep an area dry, silver fillings can set up in that. But the problem, biggest problem, difference between the two is silver fillings don't stick to the teeth. They just fill the space. Resin fillings bond to the tooth and they seal it, okay? These teeth here are very susceptible to cracking. This is like a little wedge. You bite on this and it just drives the tooth apart there because there's no bond between. And we'll see a lot of teeth that look just like this they crack and cusp break off, and then we end up with crowns and things like that. Deep cavity filled there, and then the front teeth there too. I mean, that's something to do every day. And the materials that we have nowadays are just amazing. You can, I mean, you make them just look like brand new again. And it's, I, this one of the most fun things that I can do, take a teeth like that and then just make them look brand new again. And uh, I just enjoy that a lot. Okay, if we broke a tooth or a lot of decay and you got to do something, fillings just don't hold up really well when you lose a cusp on a molar. So we have to cap or crown them, okay? Um, and that's just not in the posterior. You do a lot in the front. We can do fillings there, but these are actually crowns. And you can, I mean, they're just beautiful. These are Emax crowns. I've done some, it's lithium disilicate. It's, it's a material that it's not porcelain. Um, but it is so hard when you bond them in. I mean, I've done cases like this, but back in the early 90s, and they're still looking great. I mean, they have a little bit different material then, but it's the same, it was the same um, line of material. And these last, they work really well. Uh, studies have shown that these, this is called Emax. Emax crowns and zirconia crowns, which is a little bit different animal. It's metal, but it looks like porcelain. They're the two strongest materials in the mouth besides maybe like gold, okay? Um, and gold is great too. In fact, I just did a couple gold crowns today on a guy and they're, I mean, they're, they were awesome. You know, they, they wear like iron. I've seen some gold crowns in there for 40, 50, 60 years. But, you know, aesthetically, it just doesn't look as good. Okay, what if your cavity goes into the nerve of the tooth, okay? And that's what this is here. And then we got to take that nerve out of there. This is called a root canal, okay? And then we got infection down in here, and we have to clean this all out. And this is what we do with the root canal. We clean it out, and we put a rubbery-type filling material in there. And then we get the bacteria out inside the tooth, and your immune system can come in and clean this up. Then we got to do something on top of the tooth, either put a filling or put a crown on the tooth, you know? Um, bridges, basically, you lose a tooth. It's like putting a crown here and a crown here, and you attach a crown in the middle and you cement it in, okay? Slam dunk, been doing it for years, but um, I will move, well, um, these are partial dentures. Everybody kind of know, knows about these. This is another option of filling in spaces, and we have some flexible materials that are really, really good. What I wanted to show is a picture of this is becoming extremely popular right now. Implants. This is titanium, and there are different manufacturers, tons of them out there. But these different manufacturers put different coatings on here, but it's basically the same. It's, it's titanium, and it's just amazing. The bone grows right to it. It just locks in. It's, it, it's really, really cool. And then you can attach a, a tooth to that. Basically, yeah, we, we talked about some of these partials and dentures. I just want to talk a little bit about these flexible partials. They're really popular right now. Um, what's neat about them is they feel a lot lighter weight than the old metal ones, you know. And uh, patients, you know, typically like them. 
the materials are getting better and better too. Usually when we first started out, you know, seven, eight years ago when these started really first coming out, these stained really bad. And now the materials now we're getting are a lot better. I do a lot of this combo type of partial now where actually I do put a little metal in there for, for stability, but then I have flexible clasps that come around the teeth and hold that in. They're more aesthetic and they're more comfortable for patients too. We do a lot of these too these unilateral partials where it's just got one tooth missing and maybe you can't afford to put an implant in. You can't afford to do a bridge, but you want something in there. And these can be either temporary or they got a lot of people use them permanently. They just snap in there and they're flexible material. They're indestructible. You can't, you can't break that. And uh, I just had maybe a couple people that didn't like them. Sometimes they're older people that they can't get that fit in there and get it in and out properly. It's, uh, it does take a little dexterity for some people. Uh, implants, and then a really, really big thing, and this is just going to explode. Um, dentures, okay? Um, everybody knows what a denture is, basically. But now what we're doing is we're putting implants in here, and we're having little attachments to the dentures. They snap in there, and that can be a game changer for a lot of people. I mean, uh, it, it isn't, you know, a, when you have your teeth, you're 100%, right? With you have a, a denture, you're at maybe 10% of what you could chew, okay, ability-wise. Um, with these, you can get back up to that 25, 30% um, uh, range, maybe even higher. It depends on how your skill is for, for uh, holding that to help hold that denture in. But you can use a lot more implants too, but like we talked before, they, they have expense to it, you know. But boy, oh boy, I mean, it. I can see the day soon where standard of care is that when you take somebody's teeth out and you put a denture in, you have to offer the ability to put some implants in there to, to stabilize that denture. These are screwed in, okay? Now this is a real game changer. This is like having your teeth back. This is like getting back to that 100% level. But you have a lot of expense with this. This is where you see those commercials, you know, in, in the cities they have, they call them, uh, what's it, clear choice, I believe. Walk in, you walk out with your teeth. Well, they don't tell you everything there. One is, is that not everybody walks out with teeth because in order to get that result, you have to screw these in to bone and it has to hold. It's like dry, you know, driving a, a screw into a um, drywall. You got to find that stud in there. It's the same thing with this. You got to get a good grip on that implant on the bone. If they don't, they can't load it, and they're not going to put that in. You're going to have to go away with your denture and you know wait three or four months before you get your teeth. So it isn't for everybody. Um, two, you aren't walking out with your final prosthesis. You're walking out with um, a plastic prosthesis, which is okay. I mean, we do this too. I mean, I saw a lady today that we had done this, and she, you know she had <laughs> fighting dentures forever. We got, we did this upper lower arch, and she's just like ecstatic. She just can't believe it. But there, the other downside is the cost. It's like buying a brand new car, or a really nice car. You know, each arch is going to be anywhere from twenty to twenty-five thousand or plus. So it, but for some people, it's worth it. It's worth every penny. Um, now. When you're alluding to what you said there, yeah, it's in there all the time, okay? So you have to clean underneath of that. And if you didn't take good care of your teeth before, you got to take care of these. Water flosser. That water pick, you just flush it out of there with that because you can't get a toothbrush or anything in there. These sit just a little bit above the ridge. They don't t flush up against the ridge like the one, the other picture here. This one fits on the ridge there. These don't, so you have to clean up underneath of them. And you have to go in, it's recommended you go into the dentist once a year, they unscrew these little teeny tiny screws, and they take that out and they clean underneath. Clean this up, clean, make sure the implants look good. That's what's recommended right now. Now what we're doing right now too is we're, we're um, there's these little products that actually are kind of like these, where they snap in, instead of screws, but they're really, really strong snap-ins, so the, you can't get them out yourself. There's a little, like, an inner tube you stick in there, and you pump it up and you pop it down, or this little um, 
hook that they use. And that's becoming a lot more popular now too because these screws are a bear to deal with. This is just another view of these little screws and how it screws in there and that, okay? I'll just leave one last thought here. I love this picture, it's my office there, but our motto is excellence by choice. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. And that's what we try to practice there. So, so thank you very much for coming out. Hey, it's Bob Rainer.